was a mess. <laughs> yeah. I, I left mine somewhere a week ago. I haven't been able to find it. <laughs> I found it in the hallway. <laughs> <laughs> was there anything left in it? Thank God there was, but I didn't luckily I didn't have that much. Just got a credit card bill today for about four grand. I'm going, right. What the hell? That's when I started looking for my wallet again. I saw a bunch of IOUs in there and I got really yeah. worried. Yeah. What's up, everybody? This is Dominic D'Angelo. I'm of ad free shows, scscoops.com. But I am here today. It is on the Four Horsemen Network. We're introducing ourselves on the Four Horsemen Network, uh, presented by Arn Anderson and his show, too. But it is Straight Talk with the Boss, Magnum TA and Greg Gagne. Guys, good to see you. Episode 13. And we are here on the Four Horsemen Network. Well, good to be here. And, you know, happy Easter to both of you. And are you going to be around this weekend at all? Me? Dominic? No. I'm going to be a little busy, I think. Uh, going to be? I will be in Philadelphia. Oh, you've got to be kidding me. On the beat. Vince signed me. Well, not Vince, but Triple H signed me. And, oh, yeah. Uh, I'm ready to go. Yep. Mm -hmm. Get a big contract? Big contract. I'm going to be right. I'm going to be commentary on Raw now, doing commentary. So. Well, I think you're going to be Vince's sidekick. <laughs> oh, gosh. I don't want to. Definitely don't want to be that. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> but, I'm not uh, coming. <laughs> good call good call magnum <laughs> but yeah it should be a pretty thrilling week uh here uh wrestlemania week uh, all all that's going to go down by the time uh people hear this so the go home of raw will have happened but i do want to talk about what happened on the raw last monday when it came to the rock and cody Rhodes in that whole situation and uh wow like uh just uh, people have been raving about this episode of Raw, uh, saying that it's been the best one in 20 years. Uh, Cody opened the show, kind of downplayed it, and was like, hey, there's a, uh, you know, oh, now we got to wait till WrestleMania. Here's the lull, and kind of playing into that a little bit. Then, boom, all of a sudden, The Rock comes out, gives him the silent treatment starting off, and then it really escalates at the end of the show. Uh, pretty, pretty fascinating, pretty exciting stuff. Uh, Greg, what did you think of that presentation there? Well, it was it was set up really perfect with that that first interview that they did, mm -hmm. and when Rock came out and didn't say a thing, and they just that little whisper to to Cody, yeah. and you know they kind of teased it through the rest of the program. You know, well, what did he say? What did he say? And then uh, that explosion at the end that ca I, that caught everybody off guard. It did me for sure. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, so you know what, we've been talking. For the last few weeks on what we think the outcome is going to be in that match i'll save mine for later okay okay i know ta's got the, he's got the wheels turning over there now he wants to get he wants to get at it right now <laughs> go ahead ta what do you got magnum well i think it's amazing that you know that the rock can come into an environment that has been so adamant about not labeling you know, baby faces and heels and and turn the whole world around and given a master study on what a heel is. I mean, he has been the epitome of every textbook definition of what a great heel does in terms of his promos and his interviews, you know, that, uh, you know, just textbook. And then the violence portrayed, it like took me back. It took me back to the four horsemen jumping dusty in a parking lot and, you know, and, and just, you know, depicting something so violent that, you know, just everybody was kind of gasping and this whole angle has done the same thing. It's, it's, it's taken people off guard. Uh, it's created emotions has made people, some people offended. Some people are just sitting in your chair and going, Hey man, the, you know, the good old days are back. You know, and we're, and we're back in business. I just wonder what the landscape looks like over the next year. Because now a president has been set of a, of a heel standard that's so high that I don't know who on the roster will be given the, the bandwidth and the rope to be able, you know, they obviously can't all be that far out there but someone to be able to carry on that kind of persona that works, obviously, because if not, it's going to make every, it's going to make everything else look like, you know, kind of second fiddle. So, okay, I came in here, I showed you how it's supposed to be done. 
now I'm, you know I'm going back over here and be the real boss at the store you know and and leave you whippersnappers out here to figure it out <laughs> and, and you know I, I want to see I want to see what's coming down I want to be able to see through that crystal ball to see where they're going to go with all of it because I know a hunter knows how to create that kind of excitement and do those kind of things and I just hope his hands will be free to to use that same psychology and and the same uh you know excitement you know with some other people you know down the road because uh you know, if if the rock was 30 years old and 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 wasn't a bajillionaire and a hollywood superstar you know he could run another 20 years with this deal but i don't see that happening so uh yeah i'm really excited i love it and uh i think there's a lot of people sitting around taking notes going maybe you know maybe it's not just personality maybe it really is truly heels and baby faces hmm that old formula good guys and bad guys cowboys and indians maybe it still works yeah, yeah right, right. Simple, simple formula <laughs> yeah but um yeah i think like i as far as a big big time heel it's gonna it is gonna be very tough to fill the rock shoes when it comes to that because he's such a huge name massive star and you know uh transcends the business in a lot of ways uh somebody that you know that they could really put some more momentum behind and then build the the title the world heavyweight title behind is drew mcintyre and make him position him like if triple h has a good game plan set in place for drew obviously he won't like it's going to be extremely tough to reach a level of a rock but i mean like from a top top wrestling heel uh i think drew could maybe fit that mold so let's let, let's just propose that you know cody takes the title and, and and maybe Roman goes on a sabbatical for a little while, mm-hmm. but you know the you know just like the old days with Steve Austin and and uh, and Vince and when Vin, Vince was the you know antagonist, you know this new character the the final boss could be the evolution of of what that was you know twenty years ago, mm-hmm. and he could be inserting himself to try to you know just do him in for the next umpteen years uh you know and 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 supporting somebody like drew or 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 whatnot and and not have to be a regular but every time he comes around it's in that nasty persona that wants ill will you know done towards the entire Rhodes family and Mm -hmm. uh you know and and i'm I'm really seeing that if you're going to have a baby face champion you need somebody in that authoritative role that's going to be, you know, really like the wicked, evil persona yeah. that wants to do them in and is constantly trying to undermine them. Because mm-hmm. if not, you're not going to be able to keep the people's excitement quite the same. So I did think they would want to switch him around. But if he's still, even if he's going to be show his face, you know, once every six weeks on television in some capacity as the ultimate boss kind of deal, and that heelish thing, uh, he could be, you know, he could he could be a great play for them for a really long time and not have to really do a whole lot because he can walk and talk better than anybody they got on the roster. And he's so flipping big. He's yeah. run, like I wouldn't want to if I was those guys, any of them, in, in, including Drew. And Drew looks fantastic. But you stand anybody next to the Rock right now, and he makes them all look like a bunch of little kids. <laughs> right, it's, it's unbelievable, isn't it? He yeah. did. I couldn't believe his arms. God oh Almighty! I mean, well, he's just he's huge. You, you, I mean, look at him when he was working, you know, ten years ago, and compared to now, and mm-hmm. he doesn't even look like the same person. No, no. Mm-mm. Mm-mm. Yeah. And, and you know that entrance he had too. Holy smokes, the lightning and everything like that. That was like, man, that was something else. And I think. I, might, I keep saying this. I might be a prisoner of the moment, but that was like one of the best entrances I've ever seen. Like in a country. it was better than the Black Adam, right? Yeah, the entire movie. That's yeah. yeah, yeah. No, seriously, seriously. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, I mean, you know, you got to call an ace and ace to the space yeah. and ace, and and you know, he can create the magic if he's got somebody giving him a script he doesn't like. He can't make it make it magic but he made that thing magic and and uh you you can't follow it so you need to find a way to keep it ongoing episodically mm-hmm. over time and and keep interjecting him 
where fans are never going to know when he's going to pop into the, the scene to do something dastardly. And, right. and if need be, take matters in his own hands, which he, we know he's capable of doing. Yeah. Yeah, 100%. <laughs> well, um, something else that happened on Raw, and uh, I'm curious to get your guys' thoughts on this too, was there was that confrontation between, speaking of Drew McIntyre, uh, Seth Rollins and CM Punk, where um, Punk came out in his hometown of Chicago too, and had some words to say, made some references that uh, raised a few eyebrows and stuff like that when it came to came to some of the words. And uh, ultimately, uh, he's going to be on guest commentary for the match between Seth and Drew McIntyre. Uh, Magnum, how do you think he's going to get involved in that situation? Or do you think he well, will? He, he's so relevant and and so still, you know, the the, the WWE universe has you know embraced him you know, so well coming back where he's at home and they know what, how to use him and what to do with him. Uh, you know, I, I, they could do anything. I mean, he's, he's, uh, obviously, you know, eventually going to get back in the ring and, uh, you know, he, he could, uh, he could certainly cause Drew some heartache and, and keep him from winning the title, uh, or, or he could try to do something and Drew could still get the title, but there'd be so much animosity between the two of them because Drew has got the best one-liners. Uh, you know, I, I don't know whether he gets to contribute anything or not, or there's just some great, you know, team working around him. But, you know, he's just got the, the best persona to me that he's ever had. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. So, you know, he's, and he's got that look. So, you know, to me, whatever they can do that's going to elevate him, continue, and and not be afraid of the heat. And I don't think he's afraid of the heat. He just says things that are so obvious, though, sometimes you can't help but like, it, even no matter what the subject matter is, you have to say, well, you know what? He's right. <laughs> you know? Yeah, right. So, you know, we don't want it to be like that because, again, back to the case study on The Rock, I mean, we've got to get people, you know, emotionally involved to see that underdog. Uh, you know, come back and overcome superhuman odds and, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, setting that stage. Because, again, WrestleMania is – that die is cast. It's, I, I'm just so much more interested in seeing around that corner, you know, right now myself. Yeah, absolutely. Greg, Greg do they got you interested in the match between Seth Rollins and Drew McIntyre? Do what? I'm sorry. Do they have you interested? Are you – Oh, yeah, really, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, and I, I'm watching that one, and then you see CM Punk – all of a sudden get into a little confrontation with Rollins. Mm -hmm. He's going to be the guest announcer there. You know, paint, they're painting a the picture. Yep. They're throwing out a lot of things to keep everybody guessing what's going to happen. <laughs> uh, they're setting the table. They really are. They're doing a great job of it. Keeping everybody off balance. Mm -hmm. You know, and that, that's, that's what draws money. Not knowing what's going to happen. You know, you think you can figure it out, but I mean, here's us. We've been in it. How long between the two of us? TA, of course, a lot older than me, but uh, <laughs> uh, how long were you in the business, TA? Oh, about 10 minutes. <laughs> That's it. He's pretty green still. Six years, weren't you? I was in just under seven years. Just under seven? Just under yeah, seven. Yeah, between the two of us, and I was in 20, 20 some, 19. Yeah. You know, but grew up in it, so I lived it my whole life. Right. But, uh, you know, it was a different era back then, but they still had, the, you know, the good versus the evil. Mm -hmm. You know, they think they don't have that anymore, but it's plain in this in this uh, WrestleMania that all the way through the card and those ladies, I tell you what, you know, we haven't talked much about the, the crew they have. And somebody was asking me the other day and I said, that's the best group of lady wrestlers I've ever seen anywhere. 100%. What, what, what they have. Mm -hmm. Those girls are fantastic. They work their butts off. And uh, I'm just, I, I get anxious watching them. I mean, I, I want to watch them, right. you know? Yeah. And they all look very athletic. And that car girl that came in, holy balls, what she's going to do. Right. And even wow. my gal Tiffany, I think in the next two years, she's going to be something for them. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, every, every one of those girls on that card. <laughs> God. It's good. What if Ashley comes back and brings her sister? Pardon me? Have you seen her sister? Have Who, you seen Cardinal? Megan? No. Have you seen oh, Megan? Yeah, that's right. 
doing the bodybuilding stuff. Me, Megan looks better than than. I, I mean, I'm, I've known Megan for oh, you forever. mean. You Me, mean Charlotte? Just, yeah, Charlotte's sister. Charlotte's Megan. sister. Megan, Megan just competed in a in a physique contest in in Las Vegas and, and really and, mm-hmm. and looked absolutely phenomenal. Is she going to go into wrestling? Not? Yeah. So gonna... I said, so so maybe, maybe she's going. Maybe the sisters are going to come back and kick everybody's ass. Kick knows? everybody's ass. Yeah. <laughs> and then and then Rick will come back. <laughs> No, Man. I think Rick, Rick's got plenty on his plate. He between, <laughs> between all his business adventures and things and stuff, he he is full. He is, yeah, he's you know, yeah. he he really did well for himself, you know. And uh, I mean, we we met in high school. We played against each other, and then we went to college together. And uh, you know, Rick was Rick is Rick, and Rick was off the wall. Mm-hmm. But boy, he's gathered together and he's just done a heck of a job. And I'm really proud to be called his, hopefully I'm still his friend, but uh, yeah, he, he's done phenomenal. Look, that and whole family, the whole family has. All those I mean, ventures he gets yeah. into. And yeah, for, and Charlotte, I mean, geez, uh, we are talking about this on my other show is um, that match of the year, like the, what was nominated, like the Slammies they had. Mm-hmm. And uh, one of the matches, Charlotte was in two of the matches for match of the year. And one of those was Rhea Ripley at 39. And man, they stole the show that night. It was. Stole it. Yeah. Absolutely stole it. And, and, and that to your point, and, you know, talking about the roster there, there is, you know, they're all just superstars now. There's not yeah. like, Oh, well, we got the, the glamor girls or, or TNA or whatever anymore. They're, they are such dynamic athletes and and can can uh, communicate and sell and tell the story uh, through their interviews. You know, second to none. Yeah. So yeah, it, it's a great it's a great time to be part of that organization. It's so deep and talented, really and we and we watched them all come through the NXT program and you know develop and blossom into you know. What, what they've got. I mean, it, yeah, I, I don't see anything slowing down for any of that group of ladies anytime soon. No, man, they're, they're phenomenal. Really, the whole group. God, am I that Ripley? She is just, uh, <laughs> I mean, every one of them, every yeah. one of them is very athletic, you know, and it, it's a whole different look of lady wrestling when, when you see these girls. Mm-hmm. I even compare them, compare them to some of the other organizations out there. I mean, it's, it's night and day to me. Right, right. And, you know, to your point, Greg, uh, I think you look at how they went up through the NXT and, the, you know, like, what, how, like, legitimate they all look and things like that. Uh, a lot of pe- people give credit to Fit Finley for tra- helping train those women and get, th- get them ready. Mm-hmm. He's been, like, a huge proponent of that. And so, like, you know, to make all that kind of fit together and to see this all kind of come to fruition and stuff with these athletic women that, like, are not only beautiful, but they have that ability to to get the job done and kick some ass. It's oh. very cool to see, you know. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it really is. I wish you could turn back the clock. Right. <laughs> when you love now, why do you wish you could turn back the clock? <laughs> well, <laughs> <laughs> just, just had to do that. I'm sorry. <laughs> Don't you? When you want to. <laughs> No, I'm wiser. Oh, no, no, I'm don't give me that. Today than I was back then. I don't want to turn that clock back. I have a heart attack just thinking about it. I meant <laughs> to get in there and compete the way they are today. Oh my God, that's yeah. what I meant. <laughs> no, and and you know, and and, you, and if you go back, no, that's good. If you go back and you go back to like a Gail Kim. Mm-hmm. So when Gail Kim was in the WWE, she was all that, and they didn't want women working that style. Because right. she made all the other women look like they couldn't lace their boots up, you know, because she wasn't yeah. like a man. Mm-hmm. And and now today, I mean, she was just 20 years ahead of her time. Literally. Yeah. I right. mean, she, she never got her due in the WWE. She got much more play in TNA and Impact than uh, she did. And it is really just a cry and shame because she she had all the all those skills in that wheelhouse, you know, 20 years ago. And yeah. now, you know, and now that's, you know, it's, it's praised and, and, you know, how, oh, how great they are and everything else. And, and, uh, <laughs> you know, the timing was just a whole different era. Yeah. So it was, yeah. It's, it's, but it's very cool. 
the whole time would be a fan. Hey, what about, you know, you, you threw out TNA there. Mm-hmm. I, you know, I can't get them on, on my TV here for some reason. I mean, we're just. Yeah, I get those rabbit ears, get, get Gogo up on the roof and get her yeah. to turn the <laughs> rabbit ears around for you. I'll have Laura stand up there like that and see if we can hook in. <laughs> get some reception going on. <laughs> yeah. But how is TNA, how are they doing? I, who who they're, the, the girl there, is, she's phenomenal too from what i understand right jordan grace they have some good talent over there don't they they do like the knockouts division and it's always pretty darn stellar and that i think a lot of that too is in credit to gail kim too and like her kind of still running the ship there and oh is she really yeah she's like part of the talent aspect of it like i think across the board not just with women but i i know she has a big hand in in helping the women there and the knockouts kind of stand out and so um yeah i mean they have a good product i I'm kind of with you on them. I think I can access them, Greg, but I I haven't gotten to sit down and tune into them. Well, I'm much. trying to access it a number of times. I just can't get it here. And, and we're, for some reason where I'm living. Yeah. I'll have to see if I can try to get you the hookup somewhere. But I understand they have some great talent there. And in fact, uh, we got a couple of their action figures coming yeah, out. Yeah, so. which is very exciting. Yeah. Yeah, that's... I led into that. Mm-hmm. I was throwing it to TA, but he kind of let it slip by. <laughs> I'm still, trying, I'm still trying to get through series one of Remco. And that's I'll, it. I'll, we got to pace ourselves here. We got to pace ourselves out. In about two weeks, I'll, I'll be all, I'll be all in on that. But yeah, we we've got series one of Remco We're going to be wrapping up uh, April the eighth, and uh, wow. we've got a great reception uh, to the to this whole lineup. And I'm I'm so glad that uh, Tito and you know Ricky and Robert and, and Tully. I'm glad we've got a group of people that are still around. To be able to, you know, see these things, uh, you know, come out because our our roster is so deep in in so many guys that have passed on that is is refreshing when we've got some guys that are actually around and can, you know, go to some of these meet and greets and whatnot and autograph them and you know talk to people about them. It's a great talking point, but it's a it's, it's a really cool line. And I'm I'm very anxious to see see them uh, produced in in people's hands and. Uh, because we're going to be able to capture a whole lot of our talent line through that Remco stylization. So it's going to be cool. You know, we should have some of our viewers let us know who they'd like to see in there. Oh, yeah. And I'd yeah. like to go back. You know, I'd like to keep a, at least a couple, one or two in the ultra line every time, and then one or two in, in the Remco line. I mean, okay, like Harboiled Haggerty. Well, who was he? Well, go watch uh, Paint Your Wagon. I mean, he not only wrestled, he was in a lot of movies. Was he really? Oh, yeah. Yeah. He had a big feud with my father for a long time, and they went all around the country. And, uh, you know, and Don Leo Jonathan and, and Haystack Calhoun, uh, just great, great talent back then. And we don't want to forget them. And, and, you know, I know people want to buy this stuff, and they say, well, who's that? Who's that? Well, they're the pioneers that really built this industry. Mm-hmm. And and that's how we started this thing. And we've come now, we've got like 255 people on board and trying to keep them all happy. You know, <laughs> he's he's busting his butt, that guy right there. He's been an unbelievable businessman and is handling all that. Uh, I've got the talent. <laughs> my, my phone rings quite a bit. <laughs> quite a bit. <laughs> I look at it and I go, ew, who do I <laughs> Yeah, hey, hey, no, hey, don't oh. worry. Yeah, you know it, it's hard because we're we're kind of not limited, but to do these the way we're doing them, it takes a long time to get those molds ready, mm-hmm. and then you do the molding. What does what does it take from the start to beginning? Ta, how long does it take to actually get it, a figure? It's out? like birthing a baby. It's an eight to nine month process. Yeah, from the time from the time you decide who, and and you start you know gathering all the what we call assets. The pictures and the depictions of the look that we're going for and and maybe a belt or something that they had and all those things and then start the design process and 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 that that whole deal and then go into our our you know our what we call that pre-sale uh model which you know lasts you know about you typically about 30 days and then have to go into the whole production cycle and get them in the in the lineup in manufacturing and then, and then you think that's all great, you know that that's a five to six week process. But then, oh by the way, you got to get them here, and they're right, coming right. from Hong Kong. 
Yeah. And the ride over on the boat is no short trip. And then you've got to get them from the boat to Alabama, where our distribution center is. And that is proving to be almost as bad as crossing the Dagon Pacific Ocean. And uh, it, it's a uh, you know, it, it's a lot built into it. I, I mean, our end game and, you know, as this matures and grows, you know, we will, you know, we will not only make what we make during a pre-sale, but we'll make some some stock to keep, uh, you know, in, available to people, but not for that same price. I mean, people that, that, that you know, ante up for a pre-sale uh, deserve, you know, something special. So they get a discounted price, basically, because they're waiting you know, four or five months to get their product. And that patient's game, you know, deserves to be rewarded. But then when they, you know, come out, you know, they're immediately anywhere from 20 to 50% more. And uh, and we will start making product, uh, you know, available through either some of our retail partners or, or uh, you know, in our own stores. But, you know, eventually, there, like I said, there will be product uh, that, that will be available never to the extent of back in the day, you know, when, uh, when, they, when they were doing the AWA and it was a current product and running down to target to, you know, see what hit the shelf, though, you know, impact could become that one day because sure. it is a current product. But our, for our legends, it's going to be a continual cycle. And, and we're also trying to develop new product lines that will enable us to offer other variations and other things for them that isn't so you know, time heavy on development and getting produced and, and getting them here. So, uh, you know, this, this, what we, you know, what we know as power town today is actually uh, a universe developing that is going to encompass more than just wrestling. And it, it, it will be something uh, really exciting to watch grow. And uh, we'll be, you know, announcing more and more things about that uh, over the upcoming months right here on the four horsemen network. Mm-hmm. And uh, it'll it'll be a ride that we'll take everybody on with us and kind of explain to them our you know methodology and our uh, philosophy and what we're trying to do and uh, you know we'll all have some fun with this together. Well, let me ask you guys. I don't know, if Greg. Well said. Fantastic. Yes, I don't know if Greg or you, Magnum, know know this more, or maybe you both have the input on it. But how did the, does the selection process go when you decide which wrestlers to choose for what line exactly? It's all Greg's but, fault. Well, I thought, it's all yeah, fault. I thought I was helping with it, but the, the last two ones who came out, I didn't have any input. So <laughs> I, I just, it, it, you know, it, it's like it, it, it's, it's a slippery slope because we've got families, you know, with you know, the hard world Haggerty family, just for instance, that, you know, desperately want to see, you know, their, their dad represented. And we want to, too. And then you, in the same breath, you've got, you know, someone like Dory Funk Jr., who's going to be in Ultra Series 2, mm-hmm. and 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 was signed after some of those, you know, those other people were signed, but he's still living. And we, as we all know, we're not guaranteed tomorrow. And I, But I would very much love for him to live long enough to see this produced and you know make it put a smile on his face and so you know the the people that are with us we feel a sense of urgency to you know try to you know fast track and uh do some things that uh you know you take a little discerning to figure out you know, you know how to best represent and uh you know it, 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 it's not it's not easy because you yeah. can't make everybody happy but i know that you can't I can't bring somebody back that's already gone, but I can do everything I can to, you know, properly represent the ones that are still with us. Right. I mean, we've lost, we've lost some since we started already. Butcher Vashon. Right. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. He just Matt, passed a couple weeks ago, right? Both him, yeah. Both him and, 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 and Mad Dog are gone. Wow. Uh, you know, Baron Von Raschke now, uh, he's having some issues physically. And, you know, I'd like to get him out there before, you know, something happens and hopefully it won't. I hope he has another 10 years in him, but or 15, whatever. But, you know, he's up in that 80 range and a little better. And we got quite a few like that. And then you have the little people and we've got, you know, the, the what we call the, the men that built the champions, the guys that came and did the TV, you know, and a lot of those, you know, we still have the uh, 
Monkey Brothers, and they're still they're still talked about as some of the ones that we had in the AWA, Jake the Milkman Milliman and Frankie DeFalco, you know, and uh, those are the people that never had the opportunity to have what we all got. Mm -hmm. And, and they worked just as hard to make this business what it is today as we did. And they deserve to be recognized. And, and that's what we're trying to do. And I wish we could, you know, put out a hundred at a time, but we just can't do it. We the want process. the best out there, our ultras from what everybody says, it's the best product on the line, the most realistic. It looks phenomenal. The story that goes with it, people are really interested in that stuff. And mm -hmm. then that, that, the, the line that just came out on Remco, those are all great names in professional wrestling, you know, and we have, a, I'd like to be able to throw one, one from the old, from the fifties era in there on every run, if we possibly could. That'd be sweet too. Yeah. You know? I know. Tie it all in together and stuff. Yeah. And then we got the little people too. And the, and the girls, you know, uh, Liani Kai sent me a message yeah. the other night, you know, and she says, my God, Greg, these are phenomenal. When's mine coming out? <laughs> you know, she saw the ultra line and then she saw the Remco line. Says, this is the best two lines I've ever seen. Yeah. When, when are Judy and I coming? Yeah. I said, we're getting on it. Don't worry. <laughs> and, and the thing that's so, you know, again, we, we pride ourselves on our ultras being so, uh, you know, representative of, of truly what the athlete looked like. And so we have our first uh, female in Medusa coming out in Ultra Series 2. And and that's great, but Medusa is 5 foot 10 and uh, in amazing shape. And so we got this body type. This, I mean, she's going to look like you know, flipping Wonder Woman. Yeah. And that there, there's. I don't think there's like two body parts out of anything that we're making that we're going to be able to use for hardly anybody else. You yeah, know, you can't know. repurpose some of that. Stuff. Ta's already got one right next to his bed. Yeah. <laughs> no. And 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 but you know to that point, the Remco's you know share body types. Mm -hmm. So we are developing a, a female Remco figure uh, that will give us that versatility to start mixing the girls in to, to what we're doing because we, we recognize that's going to be our quicker path. So the, the, the game plan is, you know, something new from Powertown uh, pretty much every 30 days between now and the end of the year. Wow, that's awesome. That's, 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 that's great. And, and TA, TA has been phenomenal. He's doing all the business part of it with Steve Rosenthal. Mm -hmm. And uh, I can't thank him enough. I mean, he's just been terrific. And uh, he's staying on top of it. And he gave me a, a new job starting, starting soon. Ooh. And, not only does he have the complaint department. <laughs> but, yeah, you're the human resources. Is that what you are? Yeah. Complaint department. But this other one, I'm going to have to have Laura stay on top of me with this one because, yeah. uh, you know, I get on that computer and I get, what am I doing now? What's oh, I hit on? the wrong button. So we'll get it, though. Well, guys, if you guys are excited about the Remco's as much as I am or as much as uh, Greg and uh, Magnum are here, too, go to that put QR code. If you see it on the screen there, Powertown, hit that QR code. Or you can go to PowertownWrestling.com and you can purchase those uh, figures, pre-order them. Uh, they're $24.99 a piece. And then I believe, if I'm not mistaken, is it two twenty ninety nine dollars for the whole bundle? Is that yeah, right? Yeah, and, and $48.99 for the two packs. For the two packs, which would be the Rock and Roll Express or Magnum versus Tully. So definitely check all those out. Look how cool those are. Man, the belts yeah, are awesome. Match. Like the I quit match is going down. Uh, we got so many cool ones there. It's very exciting and stuff like that. So definitely go to powertownwrestling.com or scan that QR code. Check them out. Lots more good stuff coming on the way for that. Um, and re really, if the fans want to write in, you know, or send yeah. in something to you, let us know who you'd like to see. On By it. all if means, we, guys. We've got them on our, on, our, on our roster and we'll try to work them in or put them with somebody that or give you an idea when it might be coming out. Right. Leave a comment. And if you don't see who you want, contact Greg Gagne. Yes. At, Greg... At... <laughs> Give them TA's phone number, though. <laughs> I'll just put it later on the screen. Yeah. Is... They're all already all numbers. contacting me. All this <laughs> number directly. Talent. No, the oh. talent's been really patient. They've been good. 
and uh, they're all the ones that have, are coming out and that have been out. They've seen their 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 mold and and their product. They're just flipping out over them. Wow. They're, they're all saying, "God, these are phenomenal guys." You know, you know, we had to pitch that, and we've been at it two years, and you know, to keep everybody together and and working hard on it like we've done, and the talent's going to get the rewards from it, and that's the way we want it. That's how you that how it happens. Yep. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So exciting stuff. Yeah, I'm pretty pumped. And, uh, you know, speaking of somebody like Tully, uh, we're on the Four Horsemen Network now. So I thought the appropriate topic would be Arn Anderson and the Four Horsemen this week uh, for our big, big spotlight here. Um, Magnum, let's start with you. Uh, When did you first meet Arn Anderson and uh, talk about your friendship or your relationship with him? So I met Arn in Mid-South. Oh, so our, he came and, and and talk about the men that were helping, you know, build the territory. He was working in Pensacola and he was wrestling as Marty Lundy. And uh, and he, you know, came in to shine some people on television. And, and uh, so that was my first interaction with Arn. And then, uh, you yeah, know, and I, and I was in Mid-South for about a year and a half. So when I came to work for the Crockett's shortly thereafter, he and he would and and you could tell he had that 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 it factor even then. I mean, in the ring he was so smooth, he was very polished. He just you know he, he was just a good, great candidate for for greatness. So when I came to to uh, work for the Crockett's and they brought him in, you know, as an Anderson, and uh, he just immediately gelled and had that look. I mean, they, I mean, everybody thought they were truly related. Him, him and Oli looked like yeah. you know, apple, apple in the same tree. Right. And, yeah, same type of know, personality. Personality? Yeah. Now, we're talking about looks now, Greg. We're not talking oh, about I'm personality. Sorry. But, but, you know, yeah. I just want to know because I knew Oli's personality. No, no, no. no. Yeah. We're, 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 we're okay. paying homage to, to, to uh, Arn right now. I'll keep quiet. <laughs> So, so anyway, you know, but Arn quickly, you know, just became this amazing ring general, you know, working as a heel, you know, opportunity to lead the matches and whatnot. And he was, he was just stellar. And, uh, you know, I, I, I got to work with him in tag team situations, but uh, a couple times, uh, at one time in particular, we had a one-on-one match. I think when I, when I was during the run with the U.S. title, and uh, in Richmond, Virginia, and he was just such a pleasure. And it, to me, he's one of those guys that is a, just a crime shame that he didn't get a run with the world title because yeah. he could talk second to none. His work in the ring was spot on. It was solid. It was believable. And his ring psychology w- w- and his timing was just impeccable. So he could have gone out there and had, you know, five star matches with A players, B players, C players, whatever you threw at him, and and uh, talk such a good game that you'd want to kill him before you ever got to it. And uh, it, it was it was just very intelligent and witty, fast thinking, and a, a just tremendous communicator. And you know, and he is the the one that you know just cutting a promo and came up with the you know. The, the four horsemen, the, the riders of the apocalypse. I mean, he he dug in there and just and just you know came out with this amazing story that you know set a standard in the industry and a stable of guys that uh, you know is one of the best uh, wrestling communities ever seen. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh man. Yeah. Very well said. It's like yeah, he's so much. I was going to ask you that, uh, Magnum, too, is if you thought he could have been world champion, like. Oh. It, that's, you know. and hands down and it's just it's so and it's so strange that he were to have you know the kind of injury he had that ended his career i mean because you know obviously i had an automobile wreck spinal injury you know devastated he had one that was a spinal injury and 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 gave him permanent uh you know permanent nerve damage as a result of it particularly in his left hand and he's left-handed Mm-hmm. And uh, and and just made it where his his career was cut, uh, you know, tragically short. Even though he had an amazing career, 
and what he did behind the scenes as, a, as an agent capacity with the WWE for you know another 20 years just speaks to the great mind that that he's he had in the business and and his ability to to relay that to others because it's one thing to be able to do it yourself and be you know that five star performer but not everybody is cut out of the right sheet of cloth to also be a teacher and a mentor and bring the best out in other people and Arn you know possess that capacity and uh, to me he's just you know he he is he checks all the boxes of all the things you'd want to be able to accomplish in the business. He did them all and very well. T.A., can I ask you a quick question? <laughs> on, on the four horsemen, who are the four original? Ole, Arn, Arn. Tully, and Rick, and yep. J.J. was the manager. When did, when did Barry come into it then? He came in after, after they had booted Ole out and they brought Lex in. Okay. And then Barry was a baby face and okay. Barry turned heel in Greensboro, North Carolina, and they booted Lex cer- unceremoniously out of the horseman and made, made uh, Barry a horseman. Yeah. Wow. So, yeah. And, and Ole just came in it. I mean, again, it was created organically. It wasn't a plan. Nobody had a forecast that, you know, ours going to, yeah, you know, have these words come out of his mouth that are going to become a thing, and and uh, and Oli was on the on the tail end of his deal. I mean, he didn't want to be traveling and working and and, mm-hmm. and uh, you know working we, that hard at that station in his life. And yeah. Gene was never a part of that. No, Gene wasn't. No. Okay. Now, Gene, now Gene had been out of the, out of the ring for uh, I don't oh, know yeah. probably twenty years. Really? Yeah. Yeah. Gene. I remember, was, my, I remember my dad training Gene. Wow. And Oli, and Oli, and it's in Baron von Raschke and all the rest of them. But um, I, I don't could, know what happened to Gene. Gene had some health issue as well. I don't know what that's happened what I to thought. him. Yeah, yeah. But but uh, he he was. I mean, he was a big deal in the in the seventies, and uh, I mean, but by the t- by the time I broke in, I mean, by the late seventies, he was doing. He managed. He managed like uh, Ray Stevens and Jimmy Superfly Snooker. Uh, and you know, he, he was a great heel manager, but he'd been out of the ring for, for quite a while. Man, well, I, yeah. it's funny you guys mentioned him because last night I was on, I was recording with Rob Van Dam. His, we had a special guest, Mustafa Saeed, who was of the gangsters with New Jack and all of them, and he was trained by Gene Anderson. And so we talked about yeah, Gene really? last night, too. Yeah, so how about that? <laughs> Pretty yeah. wild. Um, yeah, that was good. Yeah, Greg, I wanted to ask you when, uh, they introduced Arn Anderson as Arn Anderson as one of the Andersons. What was your initial thoughts of that? Like him being a brother of Holy or, you know, all that kind of a relation stuff. Well, you know, I did because we were, had everything going in the AWA and the NWA had their thing going and, sh- and the Crockett's had come in and really studied our TV and mm-hmm. stay with Vern for about two or three days and try to lay out the way we were doing it there. And uh, of course, Vern had trained Gene and I thought when they created the, the horseman that Gene was in it. But then mm-hmm. as I looked into it deeper, he wasn't there. So I, I guess he had been out for a while that I didn't know about. But I knew Oli. I mean, he used to come over to our house for dinner after working out. And I told that. Drank all your milk. Yeah. Drank all your milk. That's right. Drank all, all your milk. <laughs> she had a five-gallon can all the time. And <laughs> it would be out in three days. He'd come over well, every see, day. If that, been, if that had been beer with Dusty yeah. now, that would have lasted one day. He, he did drink a lot of beer back then. I mean, he didn't. All you ever see him drink was milk. <laughs> you know, he, a little bit of an oddball, but, you know, he was a great guy. And shit, then we then Vern would make me work out with him in the living room. Hey, come here. You got to show Oli how to do this. And I said, drop kick him. <laughs> What? And he stood there and I drop kicked him. I was about 12 years old. And so, so he said, and see how he landed and how he comes up, Oli, that's it. Are you getting the picture now? <laughs> so Oli, we came really pretty good friends over the years. I worked with him at uh, down in Atlanta uh, when he was with Bill Watts down there. And yeah. he, he, to me, he's just a great guy. And, and again, a great mind in the ring and outside the ring. Yeah. How you much know, did- that, that whole crew back then 
you know, when Gene, what he was talking about, mm -hmm. they had a feel for the, for the business at that time. Like, like no, like few other guys had, I mean, they could talk, they could work in the ring. They knew how to get themselves over. Uh, you know, a lot of guys didn't, they, they wanted to be somebody, but they didn't know how to be who they wanted to be. Yeah. You know, and that's why Vern used to say, you know, you've got an inner self that you want to be. And until you let that out and let the people see who you really are, you're not going to make it. You right. can't pretend to be somebody you're not. Mm -hmm. And when I was training kids, I, you know, and I, I wasn't getting through to them. I'd take them out and get them drunk. Yeah. You know, and then they're getting rowdy in there. And I said, Hey, now this is the real you. Now give it to me tomorrow. Yeah. Show and, you me know, how it's done. In the, yeah. We're going to work out hard. And then when we're done, I want you to do an interview and I want you to be who you were tonight in the bar. There you go. You know, well, and then they, they would come over their little, you know, hesitation about, you know, not feeling who they really were. Right. Yeah. It's more organic that route. Right. Something. And a lot of guys never made it in the sport because they couldn't do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. or they try to project, they try to project somebody that they're not. And people, people get it. They just, they don't buy it. Right. Yeah. You know? people, people, that's why people, guys like CM Punk or whoever connect. Um, right. When it comes to, when you were in WCW as an agent, did you have a lot of interaction with Arn? Like what, what kind of, how did your guys' path? Well, yeah, we, that's, we all worked together. Mm -hmm. uh, Bill Watts was in charge then. Yep. So, I mean, we worked together, but Bill was in charge. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, uh, we give our opinions mm -hmm. and, you know, Arn and I thought a lot alike. We were brought up in that, you know, that, that, that same mold. And then there was other people that were working in there that weren't. And then, you know, you had the back and forth, but Bill, Bill was more on that because he was trained by my father, Vern, mm -hmm. uh, in the business part of it. And, uh, so he had that. And so the three of us kind of gelled really well. Uh, a couple of the other guys didn't fit in so well, but yeah, you know, we don't, so they don't, when you, when you came in, Arn was already out of the ring when you came to WCW. He was out of the ring. Yeah, he was right. Right. Yeah, he was. I, I was yeah. just setting the stage because I don't think, I don't know, I'm sure Dominic understood that. So he'd had right. his injury and, and was out of the competitive in the ring stuff and was working as an agent in WCW before he went to WWE and, and you know, had his run there as yeah. an agent. So, Greg, when, wait, what, when were you an agent? What years were you an agent? Oh, oh God. Was it because it was early 90s, right? Well, I got Bischoff the job down there. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, but you know, he eventually, I mean, and then I, when I came in, Bill Watts was in charge You're right? and he lost his job about maybe six weeks into it. Wow. Yeah. Cause he said that controversial stuff about Hank Aaron or, or no, not Hank no, Aaron. He, I mean, he just, you know, Bill was, uh, you know, Bill couldn't bend. Yeah. You know, he had, he had his way of doing it and Thank God, Arn and I thought a lot like he did, mm -hmm. but we were able to go outside our expertise and bring in other the feel for the other things. Mm -hmm. Bill was just no, it's this way, right? You know, and and my dad used to say to me, "It, it can't be just one way. It can't be your way. You have to listen to them, and then you have to." You, take all what they give you and what, what I give you and put it together. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And mold right. it together for everybody else. Right. You can't let them run the show. You can't always do it the way, but you listen to what they have to say and then you mold it for them. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's what I learned from him. And, uh, Bill was tough to mold. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It was, you know, it was basically his way or the highway. And, um, uh, it ended up Eric Bischoff, who I got him a job now. He's just an announcer. He didn't know shit about wrestling. <laughs> I won't go into that here. <laughs> well, so, yeah, I can always see him going, here we go. Again. <laughs> well, so who are we going to beat down this week? <laughs> the aspect of, so Arn actually, he was still wrestling in the 90s. I know he retired. He actually retired in like 90, I want to say either 98 or 97 because he cut that promo that he ended with the horseman. And um, 
So he was still an active wrestler in the early 90s when it comes. Because I know, like, they're covering it right now. Uh, November 1994 is where they're at on the Arn Show. And um, they, they, he was talking about, like, working with Dustin Rhodes and uh, even being a baby face for a time being and then turning on Dustin. And then um, they had the fall, not the fall brawl, uh, or the War Games match. And, um, you know, uh, he was tagging also with the, what was, it, what was the name of that faction that Terry Funk was in? Uh, with the 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 stud stable, the stud stable with uh, with uh, oh my gosh, I'm blanking on it, Colonel Parker, uh, you know. Uh, so he was he was still doing stuff then, but yeah, I mean, like then he, you could already tell them that they're pairing him up with people. He's working mm-hmm. with guys like Dustin. He's working with a guy like Steve Austin at that time and stuff like that yep. too. And being in the Dangerous Alliance too, Paul Heyman, all those like he was such a versatile tool player that it was like. Man, like Arn is just all over the place, and rightfully so because he's so good. You yeah, know? he was he was terrific. Very he was good, fun to work with. You know, in in the what we what we were doing. Right. You know, I never had an opportunity to work with him in the ring, unfortunately. You know, a lot of a lot of people that I didn't get to because you know I just basically just stayed in the AWA. Sent us down to Georgia for uh, we we're down there for two weeks. We we're supposed to go down and Jim and I wrestle uh, Cowboy Bob Orton and and Slater for the tag team title. Wow. They were building up to that match. So the first night we get there, we're in Columbus, Georgia. Uh-huh. Place is sold out, you know, and people don't, they don't know who we are. You know, we haven't been on TV down in Atlanta. Right. And you know, they got us with Rip Hawk and Dr. Jerry Graham at the end of their careers. Wow. And oh, we're man. We're on about the second or third match. And, you know, they said about 10, 12 minutes. So we did about 20, 25 minutes with them and tore the place. We had the people standing. And, we came in, the booker got mad at us. They said, what are you doing out there? I said, we're having a match. Isn't that what we're supposed to do? No, those two guys, they're, you know, one's 50 and he, they're retiring. We want to eat, eat them up. I said, I don't want to eat them up. We want to have a match. <laughs> yeah. You know, and look at the people. So the rest of the time, then the next two weeks, they had us working with Jerry Briscoe and Bob Backlund. And a babyface tag team match every freaking night wow. for, two, for the next week and a half. And we made about $500 each for the week. <laughs> and we're missing Denver and Chicago and Milwaukee. And we just, you know, we get more than that in one night there. Right. What are we doing down here? Yeah. What's so that? Jim Barnett's the one that wanted us down there. He was a good friend of my dad's. And oh. uh, I kind of grew up a little bit around Jim when he was in his prime. And, uh, he came in, Greg, what are you guys doing? <laughs> I said, we're having matches. Why did they put you with Backlund? <laughs> and I said, talk to your booker. I don't know why, but it's not working. We're going home. <laughs> we're done, though. <laughs> we're done. You know, $500 but Greg, a week. <laughs> we made more than that in Denver in one night. <laughs> but, you know, he brings up a point. And in the day... Every every match on the card was was like really in the early days was leading up to your main event and your main event angles, and there was mm-hmm. like when I remember working with Bill when I first started, and if if you were in the first second or third match and the same thing and he got this from Eddie Graham, and unless you were in an angle. There was things you did not do. You didn't go outside the ring, Russell. You didn't throw a punch. You didn't, you know, you didn't definitely, you know, do anything over the top rope. That was a disqualification. But they had things because they wanted things to set the stage to focus on on the main event. Mm-hmm. And as as the you know as time went on, and you had people with greater and greater skill sets, you know, in these early matches, you know. To the point, they would have you could go out and have a match so good that that main event that they paid to see couldn't follow it, and promoters would get really ticked off about that until the the business evolved to the point where it was basically main event caliber matches from the from the beginning to the end. But in the early in the early stages of it, particularly in the South, those opening matches were were there to put in X amount of time, kind of set the stage, get people's appetites whetted for what was to come. And, you know, that's the way it was. And it's, so this whole thing of, of, uh, 
I remember Ricky Steamboat was telling me a story about, you know, working in WWE uh, towards the end of his career. And he was working with, with, uh, uh, with Haku. And they were out there on an earlier match and went out there and tore the house down. And a lot of people were upset that had to follow him and whatnot. And he said, you know, Chief, you know, Chief Strongbow came in. He was the agent and was giving him a little bit of grief. And Ricky looked at him and said, you know, I was world champion. And, you know, what, what do you want me to do? You want me to regress and, yeah. and to pick myself <laughs> that I regress to the point that I forgot how to have timing or, or have excitement and all those things. And, you know, again, the, you know, those were the growing pains of, of, wrestling and, and now we have a you know obviously we have a television product that is the be all end all and the house show is a thing of the past and it's a television product and which leads us right into like the AEW you know of the world that start out with a spectacular main event type matchup you know right up right out of the shoot to set the stage for the night and really you have to do that. Because if you cut on a program and it doesn't grab your attention in the first few minutes of watching it, you're going to turn the channel and watch something else. Right. Right. So it's all gone full circle to what Greg was trying to do and him, him and Jim and, and being out there and tearing the house down in an early match. You know, now you have to tear the house down in certainly the early matches or you won't have anybody left to watch that big main event. Yeah, hundred percent. Well, see, the AWA we only had four four matches, maybe five matches on a card, so we had to put in the time, and you had to have. And Vern wanted a wrestling match on every one. He says, "You know, you show me you can wrestle, mm-hmm. and you you control those people and build it up." And uh, so, I mean, that he had all top talent there all the time. You know, you had Nick Bockwinkel, Ray Stevens, Pat Patterson, Blackjack Lanza, Blackjack Mulligan. Uh, superstar Billy Graham, you know, Jesse Ventura and Adrian Adonis. And uh, the exceptional heels always wanted to work there. Yeah. And, and you know, even Rashke and Mad Dog Bashan, you had the Crusher and the Bruiser, a different style. Theirs was just, you know, punching and kicking. So Vern wanted the rest of the card to be wrestling mm-hmm. because that's what he used to say is on the marquee. Right. So you just go out and if they can't follow you, that's their problem. That's their issue for sure. So it was a different philosophy than it was down there. And that's why Vern used to say to me, when you go down south, it's a whole lot different, buddy. It's a, another animal <laughs> down there. And he sent us to Atlanta and we were there two weeks and came back. Came on back. <laughs> and well, never went back. Before I, we talk a little AEW, I did want to uh, ask you guys and get your guys' perspective too about the Four Horsemen in general. Um like obviously, like they're one of the best wrestling factions of all time. Maybe even the best. A lot of people will say, depending on what area you kind of grew up in. Uh, Megan, talk about your experience and what your overall thoughts of the Four Horsemen are. And I want to follow up too. Was there ever an interest on your end to be a part of the Four Horsemen? And was there any ever talk of that kind of maybe coming for you? <laughs> the uh, it was a transition time because the Four Horsemen became so cool that it was, it was on the cusp of that, not because they were trying to do this, but it was where that baby face heel thing was was like, like teeter-tottering. And there was a whole faction in the building, particularly when you go places like uh, Greensboro, that there'd be a whole row around ringside. They were all dressed in, in suits and ties and stuff and, you know, and, and holding up the four fingers and the horseman fans. And so they had that, they had that thing, that cool bad guy th- vibe going, but then they could also really turn it on and get serious heat, like angles where they broke Dusty's leg or when when they jumped me in a dressing room and, and beat me all up when I was separated from Rick, and, I mean, uh, from, from uh, t- uh, Dusty. And so they weren't afraid to get the heat, and that was the difference in, you know, guy like – Tully Blanchard never in any moment in his life ever wanted to be anything but a heel yeah. and, 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 and get the heat and play that role and play it to a T. And that's what he lived, breathed, and died for. And, and Arn was, again, he was not like, you know, a wannabe babyface. He wanted mm-hmm. to be the heel. He was good in that role. He was good at, 
and you know getting the heat and the timing of it and and in not uh you know having some ego where you know he thought he should be tougher or he should be this or should be that and i never and, and barry the barry iteration of it came along after after my accident but to me it was barry windham at his best and in that group because barry was one of those guys that his in-ring game was a a plus 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 and his interview was was like a b and not because he wasn't trying to i'm just i'm just saying his, his he wasn't an over top uh you know like flair talker uh i mean arn was a was a five-star talker right yeah, barry yeah. was solid talker but he just wasn't you know, when you're putting yourself next to Arn, Arn and uh, and the Ricks, you know, there's natural comparisons that are drawn. But that whole group took him like to a whole nother level where he was really getting the ring time and the recognition, and he knew how to get that heat too. Because I mean, he he had no bones about being a heel. Uh, I think he enjoyed that role far more than being a babyface. And uh, and he was a big guy. I mean, very six five, six six, and you know when he was you know, mature, you know, in his, in his best ever role, he was probably 255, 260 pounds and could go, you know, in the ring is good or better than anybody. He was, he was a Randy Orton before there was Randy Orton. I mean, he was that, that quality of big man athlete. And uh, so, yeah, I, I, that was the best iteration of them. Uh, would I have ever, I had no desire to be a heel. I wanted to be a lone wolf baby face. I didn't want to be like I, I had, I was, I was taking myself down a road where the only real ally I had was Dusty. Mm-hmm. And, and, and I really didn't like to be, you know, I didn't want to be, you know, with the Rock and Roll Express and the teeny boppers and the this, that and the other. And I'd already, you know, smacked Bob Goggle in the face, you know, and when he was the president of the, you know, NWA and, and I really liked that character. So I didn't want to be part of a group. I didn't want to be a heel, but I didn't want to be a, a standard. I, I was kind of the attitude before the era. I was right. trying to carve a new path and a new lane. And uh, so now I, I, now I had no desire to ever be uh, anything but the character that I was carving out for myself. And, and it would have just played well as the world's heavyweight champion because I wouldn't have had to been a heel but I could certainly, you know, gone out there and been rugged enough if I was in some other promotion with somebody that was a straight baby face to, uh, you know, carry carry the role if I had to. Yeah. You know? yeah. yeah. I think, Megan, you could have fit either position, I think, to be honest. <laughs> I think you would have been good either way. Easily. I yeah. mean, totally yeah, I easily. I, I mean, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, mean I, I was definitely had that at heart, you know, I, but, but I also came up from the era that, that, uh, I had had just pounded in my head, you know, by the Grahams that a baby face, if you were, if you want to be the, the baby face, then nobody was going to beat you in a straight up fight. If it was straight up and you were toe to toe, I don't care who they were, they were going to have to cheat or take some advantage to get over on you. And, and, and when you're, you know, fighting guys that, you know, sometimes were 30 and 40 and 50 pounds bigger than you. You had to have a lot of cojones to go toe to toe with some of these guys, and you know them them hitting you with potatoes because you you know you weren't going to let them get over on you till till they did something that they, right. they you know, had to take a shortcut. I was going to make you take a shortcut, all right, or we're going to fight. <laughs> so, yeah, that's all there was to it, you know. And uh, you know, and I think that 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 you know that mindset. Is, is goes back to the heels and baby faces and the good guys and the bad guys. If, if, if they can just beat you straight up, then there's nothing about them to really make them a heel other than the fact they were just better that day. And, and we just happen to don't like this guy's personality. Well, that doesn't make a heel. A heel's got to be a coward. He's got to be, you know, you know, a, a short cutter, uh, you know, conniving, snake in the grass, do anything, be, you know, like players say, be the dirtiest player in the game if you need to and uh and and do all those things or you know you're not just a heel because you're a big ugly guy yeah <laughs> you know? that's it well greg to well, uh, greg 
<laughs> Renzel, Renzel always wanted me to turn on him. Yeah. And then Bobby Heenan be my manager. See, that would have been a great, Greg, you, I mean, we've said this before, but you would have been a great heel, I think. Oh, I am. Yeah. <laughs> I, I am. am. <laughs> I am. <laughs> I, I, yeah, I, you know, it's, with my dad's reputation and all that, it was a little tough to do that. Mm -hmm. um, but I would have liked to have had a run at it. Right. I, yeah. You could have fit well in the Four Horsemen, I think, Greg. Oh, I think so. Yeah. But, you know, I was oh, a, a great. different style. I mean, Perfect. with yeah. Vern, with, with us, you know, we had to prove we could out wrestle everybody. And he gave us enough ammunition that we could. And, and uh, you know, if we had a tough time with somebody when we went out of the AWA, we let them know. Right. <laughs> wow. How great would First that time be? I went to Japan. My dad says, okay, here's what you have to do. I'm there for six weeks. We're with Blackjack Mulligan, Moose Cholak, uh, Dale Lewis, uh, four guys who were all the top guys. Mm -hmm. and, and then Bob Bruggers and myself. And we're getting like 1500 a week and we're there for six weeks. They're getting five to 10 grand a week. <laughs> wow. So he says, okay, the first, here's what you do. The first three nights you're there, when you go to tie up with the guy, Punch him. Punch break him. his nose. Yeah. Break his nose. First three nights, I broke three noses. I never had a problem. Never had issues. No. So we're there for six weeks. And we're, we're you, you know, you have to learn your symbol. And you go into the locker room. You, oh, oh, I'm on the second match. You don't know who you're wrestling till you get out there. And the crowd is dead silent. They introduce you. Yeah. They clap. And you wrestle for 15 minutes, 20 minutes. Dead silent. Match is over. So Bob Bruggers and I, we get to the arena. We got, about, we got about a week and a half, almost two weeks left in the tour. And Bob says, I'm not on the card tonight. You know, we're, we're on the first or second match all the time. And I, I said, oh, shit, Bob, you're in the main event tonight. And you're in a cage match. Cage match. I've never been in a cage. Jesus. So I went up to Giant Bob and I said, hey, could I be, in a, be a, a manager for him out there tonight? Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. So I remember Bobby Heenan telling us, you know, you're a manager, you got to keep moving because people throw shit. Well, they're not in Japan. They're not, you know, he gets out there in the cage and they're all do this and they're quiet. And Bob's getting the shit beat out of him. He, he's cut up and he's looking at me. And I see this little thing on the, on the, uh, on the floor, this little metal thing, sharp eyes, hand it to him. And I said, hit down right over his eyebrow like that. Boom. And he didn't, he busted it open. The people all of a sudden go, whoom. I go, what the hell? And all of a sudden, I see this little Japanese guy. He jumps over the fence, and he's coming. And I turn around, and he goes running. He goes to jump over the fence. I kicked him right in the ass. <laughs> and there he went. I turn around, and a whiskey bottle goes flying right by me and hits the fence. Whoa. The people are up, and they're throwing shit. And Bob, Bob's looking. He gets beat, so I crawl up over the ring. And I'm in there, and I'm, he's all cut up. And I said, Bob, he says, what the hell are you doing? I said, well, we got a little problem here. And also I see a shadow. I look at him and a chair hits me right in the side of the face. God damn it. And I saw the guy. So I grabbed the chair and I ran up the turnbuckle and I threw from over the fence, hit him right behind the head. Every freaking chair in the place coming down on us. Whoa. So we got to get out of there. And there was a balcony and we see Blackjack Mullick come running out to help us. And we're coming through and they're hitting us with chairs. We're black. We were all black and blue. <laughs> Mulligan, he just saved us. He's like this. Somebody from the balcony throws a chair, hits him right on top of the head. Boom, down he goes. We're dragging him into the locker room. Oh we get in there and they start throwing rocks through the windows. They got the riot squad there. So we made the front page for the for of all around Japan. It caused this riot and every arena we went in, we'd have bodyguards to get in and they put us in the main event the rest of the week. <laughs> you guys are money makers. First week and a half. Yeah. <laughs> and Bob was getting a shit kicked out of him every night. And I just walked out there and was a little guy walking back and forth, letting him throw shit at me. Jeez. Oh, well, he'll they, get gave us, on they, you. They, they give us a nice bonus at the end, but it was, it was quite an experience. <laughs> he'll so get on you. Been a pretty good, I think I could have been a pretty good deal. Oh my God. Like, and you think about it too, the ties you have with flair. I mean, you being in the four horsemen like that, it would have been, it would have been some big money there. I think. Yeah. We could have turned on each other and we could have right. a lot of fun with it. Work a hell of a program there. Yeah.
We're a hell of a program. Woo! Woo! <laughs> All right, there you go. <laughs> well, cool. Well, I we'll touch upon this real quick. I just wanted to, um, uh, Magnum. You mentioned it. Uh, the opening match, uh, Will Osprey and um, taking on Shibata. Uh, I thought that was a really well-paced kind of match. I'm going to let you guys talk real quick. The dog has to go, go for out it. and I'm alone. Go for it. Yep. I'll be right back. No problem. But, oh. yeah, we had the uh, Shibata versus uh, Will Ospreay opening the match, and then we had a, a good end cap of, of a match, too, with Swerve Strickland taking on uh, Takeshita. So, uh, Magnum, I just want to get your thoughts real quick on those. I, I thought the match was was excellent match. I, I There are elements of – the stylization that the guys do today that when in, in their storytelling that, that I not quite in my wheelhouse I'm from and, and you and I were, were talking about it earlier, but they had an exchange of forearms and, and Osprey, you know, fit great looking athlete, you know, and throwing these forearms that, you know, his opponent not only doesn't sell, doesn't really even register. And he returns with a forearm that, you know, that, you know, he, he puts him on the ground and the, the, this, you know, he was trying to depict, you know, the, how, what a strong heavy hitter this, this guy was, but in doing so to me, you know, you, you still got to establish your own credibility and what you're capable of doing. So to me, you know, I know he was telling the story because he knew he was going over. He was trying to, you know, do, you know, make this guy, you know, you know, a beast, so, you know, when he beat him and then beat him, you know, uh, with great authority and, and clear cut, you know, very crisp move on the end of the match, which it was fantastic. It's just those little nuances of during the match, things that establish credibility of, of who each of you are from a, from a, you know, what you're capable of thing. I, if I was producing it, I would just have suggested you know that yeah you can you can definitely have somebody else get the better of and you can make them the stronger in an outcome but to have somebody just no sell something uh to me is, is really questionable today because these guys are yeah i mean they're artists at what they do and nobody can feel it they can only see the way it's reg registered or or you know sold by the the person in the window. So I think they're missing opportunities to me uh, yeah. for maybe even making things better. And I'm sure when he and Daniel Bryan get together and, and because I've watched Daniel work too long, I know that that will be, you know, a, you know, a, a, you know, five-star, you know, epic, you know, in historical data, you know, of wrestling and it'll, it'll be, you know, looked at as, as this classic confrontation. And, uh, those are just little things that, you know, for me, I, I would I would take a little different. Now, the opposite of all that was then watching Swerve Strickland, you know, later on in, in, in his match. And that guy has just got, he's got the right stuff. His opponent was as physical as what he needed to be for that confrontation to paint the picture that it painted. And it checked, it just to me, checked all the boxes. I mean, it, it, and, and, you know, and frankly, you know, it's kind of good that the first match was, was, you know, good. And it was, it was this, that, and the other, and it wasn't completely over the top because it set the stage then for that confrontation that took place. And it was amazing. And then, you know, Samoa Joe's comments on the end of it, you know, he's, he's just being the classic heel again, playing the heel role and doing a fantastic job of it. And, uh, you know, you've got to believe as a fan, those fans are sitting there wanting to swerve to beat him and, uh, and believing be based on the way he's telling, he's doing his storytelling in the ring that, uh, you know, that he's, he's really the next guy you know, to do it. Let me ask you um, this. What, do you think, um, would it be a good move to put the title on swerve at dynasty if he, they were to face one another, or would you, continue on with Joe as, as the, I, I think, I think it could go either way with it. I think they could draw. I, I think the chase is always, you know, the most exciting thing. I think it's maybe too early to, to, to do it, but I would, if whatever, if, if they don't do it, I would do something that was to the point where they saw that he could do it 
if the moon and stars all lined up and and but keep the you know keep that focus between those two and just build build it to an even higher crescendo because uh you know to where you know may you know maybe maybe Samoa Joe gets out does something and and uh you know the, where they have to bring it to a cage match or something to contain the battle uh, because it is it's too much meat left on that bone to just uh do it yet and and again Samoa Joe is just being the perfect you know perfect character you want your heel champion to be and 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 it's not like th- there's not a much longer build up in a contest uh they they can go on between those two so you know I'd, I'd milk it out a little bit longer but they can't really go wrong either way uh it's just if they you know if they were to switch it they've got to do something to keep the heat on to get those two right back in it again where uh you know if he were to get it, it's not like some big pomp and ceremony that uh, Samoa Joe still ends up getting some dastardly heat on him, you know, even having lost uh, because he's just so believable. I mean, the, you look at him and people believe he, he gets you in the rear naked choke, it's over. And that's what it should be because that move is not a milk it kind of move. If you're somebody gets you in that, you're flat out, they've got you stretched out, you're not getting to a rope. And 15 to 20 seconds is over, and that's what it should be. And they painted a picture that Joe can do that. So if they stay in their lane and stay with their storytelling, they they got some great stuff they can do with it. Well, let's close it out with this. I want to ask you guys both. Uh, the ratings for Dynamite were not good this week. I believe they were in the 700,000, 740,000 or something like that, I believe was the ballpark. And then they had their lowest demographic rating, which was a 0.23, 14 to the 49, I believe the demographic um, let's uh, what Greg, I know you've watched some episodes and stuff like that. If you had to make one huge change of dynamite AEW and how it's delivered, what would you do to kind of boost that rating or try to get some traction going with the ratings there? Hmm. Man, that's a tough one. To me, it's the, it's the style in the ring. Mm-hmm. It, it, you know, that, that dictates, whether they're going to turn the channel or not. And, you know, back when when we wrestled, you had to emotionally get the people involved with you. Mm -hmm. You know, WWE still does a really good job with that, even with a faster paced match. They get into the personalities. I don't get into the personalities down there when I'm watching that show. Mm -hmm. There's nothing that they say in their interviews. Nothing they do in the ring that gets me really excited to wait for the next match or to see what's going to happen next in the ring. You know, they'll stand there and chop each other 10 times looking at each other. You know, tell a story. Tell a story. Get the people emotionally involved in your personality and your character. And you do that by what we call selling and and not dying you can't just lay there you sell you make the people feel that pain that you've got in your shoulder or in your arm or your neck or your leg and slowly come back out of that that was one thing Vern used to tell us you know they're selling and dying and there's learning how to make a slow comeback and build that thing up and not to blow my own horn, but that's what everybody told me I probably did best. Wow. Yeah. And Bach with a friend of mine, George Shire, he's a, a writer and a, a historian. I know Roy, yeah. Yeah. And he'll tell you when Nick, he would ask Nick, what is it like working with Greg? And he said, it's a night off. Because a lot of times, as a baby face leading the match is unheard of, but Uh-oh. you can control it and let, get the feeling it and let you run it. What happened? You froze a little bit, but you're good now. You lose it? You're good oh, still. Really? really? Yeah, I'm sorry. That's okay. Anyhow, uh, you know, and I'm not trying to blow my own horn, but I think that's, you know, I know what I did best and what 
my limitations were I wasn't the biggest guy, so I can't go out there and just pound guys. I got to out wrestle them. And then when they get me, I got to, you know, sell what they're doing. But not dying and not letting people know that they can eat me up. You know, you come out of it, come out of it, boom, boom, a nice deal. And somebody pull your trunks or something or your hair and they get you back in that hole. People go, son of a bee, you know. That, that's me. But, and I, I, I see more of it recently through the WWE. I don't see much of that with AEW. I hardly see any of it. I, I, I mean, you know, who's the toughest guy? Who cares? <laughs> you know? yeah. I mean, really, you, you want to tell a story. You want to get the people into the, into the match, into the personality. Absolutely. And, and if you can't do that, uh, how are you going to hold them? That's and that. If your ratings start going down, you're doing something wrong. Absolutely. And I agree. I completely agree with you, Greg, because, you know, in Magnum, I'll shift to you here too, but we talked about Osprey in that match. I got excited because when he was the opening match, I was like, oh, you know, maybe the fact that he's in the opening match, it means that we'll get to hear him talk later on or hear more from him later on in the night. We didn't get any of that. We didn't get nothing. And it was just more matches, more matches, little touch of story stuff, but very, very little. Uh, Magnum, what would you do? What would be your big so, proponent? Yeah, so it's, a, it's a, the the stylization is the stylization. The matches could always be tweaked, and and sometimes they have you know really good ones. Sometimes they have, oh my goodness, why they do that? But it's the, the bigger picture is the overall programming, and and getting the the you know really getting the squeeze out of what they're putting their money in. They don't know how to make somebody a star. They don't know how to feature throughout a program and and point towards something coming to 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 get that anticipation up. It's because the the personalities, all the things Greg's saying are absolutely correct. But even with that, without being able to put things in the right sequence at the right time in a show and point to it and set somebody up for it's like setting somebody up for a hot tag. If you if you don't set the stage right when they get it, when they get out there, it, it doesn't. They don't get the full burst of what all that should be. And and for an interview or an angle or something that's coming up in the show, not to be set up right by the announcers and things that you do, like you know, to Greg's point, and you know, the WWE could write a master class on. You know, what, you know, taking something from backstage to in the ring to, okay, and it also something else plays along three quarters of the way through the show involving the same thing. You can follow that bouncing along, that bouncing ball throughout the whole piece. And when it picks back up, you, you remember exactly why you were interested and intrigued about it over here. And that, that takes some understanding of television programming and and I, I think that you know we we can't all be the masters of everything. I, I, I think Tony is a genius on a host of levels because he does a lot of things successful besides just you know being the main man in AEW. So he's got all kinds of skill sets. But that said, you know the the greatest leaders know how to get people around them and 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 fill in the gaps. Because to your point, if those ratings point to, ah, you know, we're not, you know, we've just signed, you know, $24 million worth of talent and a couple people that we brought in and the needle should be going, whoop, moving over here. And, and even for those people, I feel bad because they got to feel like, ah, man, I'm, you know, I'm here and this thing is really just not happening. Almost like when I first came to Crockett Promotions and, and Dusty and I were sitting in a big old building it would seat about 8,000 people. And there was about 1,500 in the building. And we were sitting up at the top watching the matches. And I scratched my head. I said, uh, I said, bud, we got to do something about this. And, 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 and we did. And we got on the super station and things exploded. But again, if it's not working the way you're doing it, that's the definition of insanity to continue to do the same thing over and over again, expecting a different result. No matter how much money you've got, you have, I would say, I don't know who he would ask, but I would start with the guys that had been part of successful things 
like the Chris Jericho's and Tony Schiavone's and, and those guys and, and, and get them to be open and honest. And it's not pointing a finger. It's not, well, you just don't know what the flip you're doing it, It's well, you know, maybe, you know, we need to strengthen our team here and here and do some things to, you know, allow us to get some continuity and figure out how we're going to feature people and get people you know, more invested in, in these characters. And, and that would be a great conversation, a great starting point because they got, it didn't like they don't have the juice, but they're not getting the squeeze out of where they're pouring the juice. Yeah. And, uh, you know, and so I, I see that's the systemic problem uh, in, in the whole thing. And, you know, guys can sit back at armchair quarterback it and, and, you know, from Eric Bischoff to, to ourselves sitting here doing it mm-hmm. but until that changes, they're going to have the same struggle and they're going to have their big wins when they go to Wembley stadium. And when they do certain, you know, you know, things that they've already got in their wheelhouse and they know how to do, but to get that needle to start getting a million plus watchers instead of where they're at, that's, uh, you know, you, you've got an educated audience and, and if you're not entertaining them today, they're gone. They're gone. They're gone. It's a really well said, Magnum. And it's, I think both of your guys is the mind you guys have for it. It's just like, boom, you guys, I mean, Tony Khan should get you both on the horn. I think and, uh, <laughs> you guys would write the ship. You'd write the ship for sure. Well, it'd be, it'd be, a, it'd be a quite a chore. I mean, it'd be a lot of, it, it, you wouldn't have to start over, but you have to change things. And some of the people there are, won't like that wouldn't like the changes yeah Mm -hmm. especially talent talent wise Mm -hmm. you know um to me some of the you don't have enough veterans that they'll listen to and as they go along they all think they know what's best and they do it and you have to have somebody in charge says hey dominic this is the way you're going to do it tonight right and ta is going to do this and that's the way it has to be Mm-hmm. But it goes them. back to leadership. All the things you're talking right. about are the, are the are the are the soldiers. It yeah. all comes back to leadership. It all comes back when you walk in a building and and being able to you know look up on a board and know where you're at, what you're doing tonight. What I'm you know, yeah, we may have we may have our time to work on our thing at X time or whatever. But it's all about organization and about you know come having a plan. And yeah, you can modify the plan at you know at some point in time. You can you call an audible, but that should be the exception and not the rule. And mm-hmm. and I feel like they they work in a very uh, knee jerk reactionist type environment. And and so to fix things without structure is is, is difficult. And and someone being accepting of being cognizant of that without without taking it as being uh, that you're not capable is just constructive advice you know if you if you want to if you want to get those ratings up then you know obviously this isn't working the way we're doing it so let's find another way that we can do it and utilize these same people and all these very talented passionate people and give them a chance to uh to really shine yeah that's it It, and that 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 talent needs that direction Mm -hmm. yeah you can't let the talent run the program Right, and I think it's a, the what you were saying, Magnum. It's a, it's the leadership and being able to to be aware of where your strengths, where your weaknesses are, and then delegating it to the right appropriate parties that can really enhance your product, build mm-hmm. it up, tell that kind of story. I mean, you guys mentioned it being a television product and and having that television mindset of it all. That Jennifer Pepperman, who got brought in, she not only worked with WWE, but she worked on soap operas too. And like I think about how soap operas get structured sometimes, where you would think you would see an intro of of two characters that have an interaction or a scene together, then later on, throughout that show, you see them back. They're back into it, and they're back weaved into the story and stuff like that. I mean, obviously, people always make that comparison of soap operas and pro wrestling together, but totally, I, totally, totally, what it is. So yeah, you know, so it, it, is is some way you know, having the big boy decision to to have that conversation, and you look at the guys, you know, they had Arn Anderson there, they got you know Dustin Rhodes there, you know, they they've got Billy Gunn there, they have got guys that have been part of as big of successful things as you could ever be part of. 
and and uh, oh, and and it would it would just blow my mind to see Dustin show up at WrestleMania and swerve everybody. That would be the coolest flipping thing ever. How about that? Yeah, I almost forgot. Yeah. You just planted the seed. There we go. <laughs> You're getting everybody's hopes up now, Magnum. <laughs> That's what's yeah. gonna happen. <laughs> yeah. Well, cool. Oh, you guys oh. got my hopes up. This has been a fun episode. Uh, and, and he screws Cody. <laughs> oh my gosh, jeez, Greg, don't get started. You are a heel. You're a real heel. <laughs> well, man, oh. what a first episode to have here on the Four Horsemen Network, covering Arn, talking about him, talking about the Four Horsemen, talking about Power Town figures, uh, covering up WrestleMania week here. It's going to be a lot of fun, guys. Again, if you like what you're seeing. And you like to hear about these Remco figures, which are super duper awesome. Go to powertownwrestling.com. Get your figures now. Get them pre-ordered. $24.99 on, on the single packs. Then uh, what is it again, Magnum, for the two packs? $48.99 for the dual packs and $220.99 for the, for the whole pack, I believe. For, all, for, all, for the whole uh, bundle. Plus you get that sweet bundle. poster yeah. that Hal Haney made, which is amazing looking. Just a fantastic. Look at this thing. That was so great. Look at that thing. Yeah, so you man, get that awesome. with the bundle too. Man, amazing. What a collector's item. Where'd you get the, who built who did the poster, TA? Hal Haney. Yeah, Hal Haney is the art. Yes. Who did? Hal Haney is his name. He does a lot of those um man. Uh, artwork things for wrestlers and things like that. Steve Austin has put him over. Bret Hart has loved his work. Um, in addition to that, he's also helping with that uh video game that's coming out. I think it's the Ultra Pro Wrestling, it's called. And uh, he did all the artwork for that too, and the character design. So very, very cool stuff. Well, I'm in there. Cool. I'm in that. Yep. You are. Oh, that's sweet. Yeah. I can't wait to. Okay, you'll be my first match when I buy well, that. You're in, the, you're in the video game. Yeah, yeah, he's in. We need to get a video game for our our power town. Yeah. Ooh, how about well, you that? need to work on that? I, I already got in one. Well, he, <laughs> yeah, he's got. He's <laughs> yeah, there you are thinking about yourself again. <laughs> He's set. He's very oh, about you. <laughs> they called well, me guys, up. I'm just, I'm just a talent. I'm just, you're a, just talent. a talent with them. <laughs> guys, well, you can follow give Magnum. Me the name on... and I'll, I'll pitch it to him. Yeah. <laughs> we got <laughs> 255 talents, and you know, I've never had that opportunity. <laughs> the oh, facilitator. No, 254. You have had it. <laughs> <laughs> the facilitator, Greg Gagne. I like it. The facilitator okay. and the boss. There we go. Yeah, there we go. There we go. The I final like boss. All ah. right. You're the final. Oh, oh, uh-oh. Uh-oh. I admit he's the boss. He's the boss. <laughs> I'm just uh, the carry out the instructions. Yes, boss, whatever he wants to do, I was going to do it. <laughs> well, hey, if you guys uh, want to follow the boss, you can follow him on Twitter at the real Magnum TA. You can also follow him on Instagram at Magnum underscore TA. And follow Greg on Instagram, too, at Gagne.Greg. And uh, Greg posts some awesome photos there, some real good throwback photos. Such cool stuff on there, Greg. You do a really good job on there. When so, I remember to do it. When you remember to do it. <laughs> I uh, missed a couple days. Yeah. <laughs> you can follow me on Twitter, at Dominic D'Angelo. But, yeah, guys, scan that QR code you see right there. Go to PowerTownWrestling.com. Get those figures. And, uh, yeah, it's been a great episode. Uh, can't wait to continue this. Uh relationship with the four horsemen network uh and check out the orange show on here too and we'll go we're gonna have a lot more great content coming up here so are we gonna be back to back with Arn? yeah well so Arn, i think his show his show debuts every uh saturday, every saturday. saturday. he'll be on saturday and we drop every tuesday so guys tune in there uh go to the four horsemen network.com i believe we'll have that website set up but just tune into that that youtube channel check it out and uh guys Hey, we will see you next week here on Straight Talk with the Boss, Magnum TA and Greg Gagne. Finally, we're horsemen. <laughs>